All right, so happy return, and we will talk about quadratic functions. A little bit of a review. So this is intended kind of for a grade 11 course in functions. Now, in the introduction of functions, you have run into quadratics in grade 10 in quite a lot of detail. And what I want to just kind of go over are some concepts or I guess some properties with regards to these quadratic functions, so things to keep in mind. And those would be, you know, please remember that these quadratics typically will come in three different forms. So a standard form, factored form, or vertex form. And I'll show you uh, those. We'll go through those through an example. You know, you should kind of remember the line of symmetry because these quadratics are parabolas. So they are symmetric around a particular line of symmetry, which we can find. Now, another concept to which you studied actually in uh, probably grade nine at some point with regards to just studying relations of lines. And in lines, you know, we were talking about first and second difference. And what is that first and second difference um, when you apply it to quadratic functions? So I'll do that through an example here as well for you, just to show you. And you will notice that there's actually a pretty neat pattern that comes out of these first and second differences just like you had in your lines when you were studying them in kind of grade nine. Now, if you've forgotten that, I'll put up a link okay, to lines and the first second differences, a deja vu if you like. And then finally, I'll try to concentrate on domains and ranges. Now, in these domains and ranges for quadratics, they're much simpler than most functions that we have or that we run into. Now, quadratics, in general are just polynomials. And if you've studied polynomials, um, you know, you'll have a much bigger concept. Now in quadratics for the domain and ranges, what's going to be nice is that we don't really have any restrictions on the domain, but we do have some restrictions on the ranges. And we'll try to do that through an example and just kind of refresh your mind on these concepts. Now, if you've studied these in the past, you remember them, you know, you can kind of skip this video when you're going through this series of grade 11s, but I think it might be worthwhile, at least kind of even in a fast forward way to see and refresh yourself. So let's get started. So first off in terms of forms. So I always like to create these functions as kind of inputs and outputs just in my mind. Um, you know, there's something coming in, you know, we do something to it and that's the actual function that we have. And then we get an output for the individual inputs that are coming in. Now our function, so this f of x, so what we have is it's going to be a quadratic. Now in quadratic, okay, so if I would look at through, through some kind of examples through it, and I'll try to do that. If I have, so for instance, um, a quadratic in factored form. So in factored form, that means we have some zeros that we can obtain. So we have some factors. So let's say I have 2x plus 1 and let's say x minus 2. So these are my two factors that I have. This is a quadratic and it is in factored form. Now, what makes this in factored form? So the general kind of factored form that we have typically looks something like this. If we can factor, so I'll say, okay, so this is my a1. So notice, so here's your a1, okay, so this is your b1, so that's what we have there. And then we have another one right there, b2. Now, your teachers or your textbooks, you know, might put it in so many different forms. You can put these factored forms in different ways, but the idea is that you're going to be able to factor them out into kind of two terms that you have. And now here, so this a2, well, in this case, a2 is just one. And then this b2 right here would have been this negative two that you have there. Okay, so in your class, you know, you might sometimes write this as simply as a, and then, you know, sometimes they'll do it like this, where your factors, okay, you factor something out, and then you have really just two terms like this, where your r, and your s are basically um, the zeros, okay? So those are the inputs that are the zeros into this. That's a factored form. Now, 
We can expand this out so I can take this original one right here and I can expand this out so I can you know do the distribution. Okay, so go ahead. So I'm gonna do that and distribute this through and I can collect my like terms. And that's going to take me and give me, so what I have is, so in fast forward fashion, There you have it, all right? Now, we know that these two are equivalent, so they're exactly the same thing. They're definitely polynomials, certainly a quadratic, okay? So notice the order is two on the x. And now in the second form that I have, this would be known as the standard form. So the standard form for all quadratics that you have or that you run into is basically ax squared plus bx plus some c. Now, of course, the a, the b, and the c are some constants, some numbers. Typically, we'll put them as integers, but they don't have to be. And with those, um, what we have is, is our standard form for this quadratic. Now, this one was in factor form because we have factored it out into two, two factors, giving us the zero. So I can do that. Now, the last form, which is extremely useful when it comes to graphing is the vertex form and that form is probably the most useful that we have especially if you want to get a visual for a quadratic okay so that is the um, vertex form so I'm going to do the vertex form right here for us so we're going to have to complete the square so let's say if I'm going to do this right here so that is my standard form so I'm going to take the standard form and then do the um, completion of square within here. So let's do that. All right, so here is kind of the process for completing the square. So notice, so what we do is, okay, so we concentrate really just on these two terms. We, again, so we take out the two, so we factor out the two. And so that is going to be our kind of A that we have. It's going to tell us, you know, how our parabola is opening up or down and then, you know, how it compresses or is, or is compressed or stretched. And notice that if I take out the two, so out of the three, so what I'm going to have is three over two because I took out the two out of those two factors. This negative two I put at the end right there. That's what we have there. And then what we do is we take here, Okay, this 3 over 2, and in order to complete the square, we take 3 over 2 and we divide it by 2, so we get 3 over 4, and then notice we get a square, okay, then 3 over 4 again, okay, and a square. Notice 1 is plus, 1 is minus, because we don't want to change anything, and that is the completion of squares. Now, if you want to see a lot of examples of this, I'll put up a link up above there, okay, if you like, but this is just for review purposes. And now I can go ahead and complete the square in its entirety. So I'm gonna have two. And so from the x, it's going to be minus. And that is, so here we have three over four. This is squared. Now that two right here is gonna multiply this one right there. It's gonna be minus, so two, three over four, squared minus two. All right, and now we can finish this off. Okay, so I'll do that in fast forward fashion. Okay, so now we have our quadratic and this one is in its vertex form. Those are the three forms that you run into. Now, the vertex form is definitely the most ideal for graphing because from this vertex form, okay, so from right here and right here, we know exactly what the vertex is. So the vertex here would have been 3 over 4 and negative 25 over 8. So that would have been our vertex form. Okay, so we know that. We also know from here that this 
within this two. So we know that this parabola is going to be opening up upwards. Um, and then you have this two. So it, okay, so within the y, it's going to get a little bit more kind of stretched, okay, that you have. So that's what we have right there. And we can graph it, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take these three forms and I'll graph it for you on decimals so that you can see that they're exactly identical and they're going to be just on top of each other. So let me do that. All right, so on the left hand side, I guess you see, okay, so the different forms that you have, so factored, standard, and then vertex. I'm going to kind of shut them off within here. All right, so here's the first one that you see. Let me make this a little bit bigger now. All right, so the first one is just in its factored form. All right, so now that's that. I'm going to turn that off. There's nothing. The second one is in its standard form. All right, now notice I'm going to turn both on and they're right on top of each other. And then the last one that we have is its vertex form. And so here is that one. Let me turn off the rest. All right, and again, so notice if I turn all of them on, they're just on top of each other. Those are the three different forms that we had. And so within here, so here are our zeros, so two zero, and then here would be negative 0 0.5. That we can see from the factored form. So within the factor form, so notice it was two X plus one, which indeed is negative one over two. It's one of the zeros. And then the other one is two. Okay, so that's what we have within here. Now, as a deja vu, so if I would, for instance, take this, I'm going to take this in full, and I'm going to okay, take a picture of it, okay, just so that we have this particular form. And then I'll just kind of remind you in terms of the lines of symmetry. So the lines of symmetry that we have I'll put this back in and then I'll plot it within decimals. So that's a little bit again of a review. So here, so for this line of symmetry, line of symmetry comes from the fact, okay, that you have, so you, if you have your vertex, okay, so let's say if your vertex was right there, um, the symmetrical line is basically where it splits the parabola kind of in half and it allows us to have symmetry along that line, okay, to the left and then to the right. All right, so it's gonna be like this. Let me move it onto the vertex. So here is your line of symmetry. And that line of symmetry is always going through the X value of the vertex that you have. And since, for example, you have the vertex form, so you know that this is going to be happening at basically um, three over four, because that was the value for X. So if I go back um, to decimals within here and I try to plot, so I'll put X is equal to three over four. Notice that it gives us this line of symmetry right there so that you can see that how symmetric it is, right? So that's another concept, you know, that you should kind of remember for these particular quadratic functions, things to keep in mind. Now, one thing that I will say is um, some parabolas do not have a factored form. Um, so you can't really factor it. So you might be stuck only with the vertex form or you might be stuck with the standard form. Now, why wouldn't it have a factored form? Um, so you kind of have to think back, like what does it mean to have a factored form? It means that your quadratic um, actually is capable of having zeros um, within its function. Now, if you look in here, so if I go back here into decimals, so this parabola certainly crosses the y is equal to zeros line, so it does have two zeros, right? So our zeros came in these two particular points. But if this parabola was moved up ever you know, so slightly, so if I moved it up just a little bit, um, then we actually wouldn't have any zeros and we wouldn't be able to have a factored form. So keep that in mind as you study these because it's not always possible to have a factored form within these parabolas. Now, if the parabola was looking downwards, so if it had a negative 
um, A, okay, so in this case, so for instance, if I would throw in and I'd go in here and I'd put a negative, okay, so notice if I just do, did that, so there's a reflection upon, and that comes just from your transformations um, of quadratics, which again, you have studied within parent um, functions. So I'll put up a link up above there if you want to take a look at those transformations. Notice that this green one, um, again, wouldn't be able to have a factored form because of the fact that it doesn't have zeros, all right? Because it starts off at the vertex and it starts to point down and it never, never actually crosses the y is equal to zero line. And this would not have a factored form, all right? While this one would. Okay, so coming back to here, so what else, you know, should you kind of keep in mind? Well, one thing is, you know, so we've mentioned these standard forms and factored forms and vertex forms. You know, we talked about line of symmetry. You know, what else could you kind of keep in mind? Well, what about first and second difference? Um, what do these things mean? So let me do a table of values for you because that's what first and second difference comes from. So I'll take this exact problem we have and um, I'm going to put some numbers into it and we'll talk about this first and second difference. All right, so that took a little bit of time because I wanted to go through those calculations. So what I did was I took our function, so here's our quadratic in its standard form. I took some values, so I took about five different values, so I'm creating just a table of value, and then here's my outputs. Now my outputs are basically coming in from this um, function that I have, and so for negative two, so this is what I get. This is for negative one, negative for zero, and for one, and for two. So those are the corresponding outputs that I carry for this quadratic. Now, my first difference, if you recall from you know studying the lines, if you were doing differences, you notice that there was a, a very nice pattern when you had lines. Now, would we get a similar pattern within here because it's a quadratic? Okay, so first difference is we're going to take the values that we've obtained. So in this case, we're gonna take these values and we're gonna take the difference, meaning we're gonna subtract them. Now, if I subtract this, what I'm gonna get, so 12 minus three is going to give me nine. So that's the first difference between those. Now I can take now these values as well. So between these two, so three, and I have then negative two. So I can take the difference between those so three minus negative two, it's gonna give me five because negative and the negative. And then I continue this. So let me complete this. That would have been our first difference. Negative two minus, so this is gonna give me one. And then finally here, okay, so here's my last one right here. And negative three, okay, minus zero is that. So those are my first differences um, in between. Now, when we had a line, we noticed that there was a, a nice pattern that we had here, that the first differences all of a sudden turned out to be constant. Now in here, they're not constant, okay? So if you subtract them. So here is where it's kind of nice to see what happens if you have your second difference. What if you took these and again, you basically took the first differences and then you subtracted those, what would they give you? Now, so notice nine minus five is gonna give us four, okay? And then we're gonna have five and one, which is gonna give us four. And then we're gonna have one and minus negative three, which again is gonna give us four. And hey, wait a minute. For a quadratic, it looks like the second difference is constant. So for lines, when we had lines, y is equal to mx plus b, 
we noticed that our first difference was basically constant. It was just a constant number that we had. Now, in quadratics that we have, so you can write them, in, let's say, in this form, so plus bx plus c, it looks like our second difference is the constant. And that is actually true. And it comes from the fact because your lines were of order one polynomial, and then your, here was your quadratic, okay, it's basically order two. And you will notice that you have this pattern. Now, the other nice thing from this difference, I mean, obviously we have tools, so we can clearly see, and there's much easier ways to be able to see it. But from your second difference, so from this, if you do this, if you are able to create a table of values or someone gives you that, um, if you notice that this is positive constant, it actually tells us that the parabola is looking upwards. And if the second difference was negative, right, it would be constant, but it would be a negative number. It means the parabola is actually looking downwards. And that's a pretty neat thing. All right. So in terms of first and second differences, sometimes in school you run into this and you can get some kind of intuition of what is happening. Now in quadratics, your second difference is actually always going to be constant. You can take any quadratic you like and you can play this game of table of values and you're going to be noticing that that's exactly what happens, which is pretty neat. Now, the last thing that I wanted to talk to you about with regards to this kind of little bit of a review on these quadratics and then the functions is domain and range. Now, for the domain and the range, when you are dealing with quadratics, I hope that you remember, but if you don't, I, I hope that this also kind of brings you back a little bit. Okay, so what are these domain and ranges? Well, we said that the domain is always the input, right? So it's basically, I mean, we label it as X, it doesn't have to be, but it's the input to your function. And what is the allowable input that you have? Now, in all our quadratics that we run into, so here's the standard form for the quadratic, that's what we have. Now, in this, it's basically just a polynomial that does not have a denominator at all. So it's not a rational polynomial, it's just a polynomial directly. And for that matter, okay, whenever you're dealing with polynomials that don't have any denominators, um, there's really no restrictions on the domain, which means that our domain that we have for all our quadratics is basically the set of all real numbers. Unless, you know, you are facing something where you restrict it purposely, um, and that may happen, but if there's no restrictions done on purpose on an actual quadratic function, it is basically the set of all your rational, uh, real numbers, actually. Sorry, so not just rational, but real numbers. So that's what we have. So there's no restrictions at all, and that's the domain. But that's not the case for the range. So for the range, you might think, well, since there's no restrictions, maybe I get all values for the range. But hey, wait a minute. The one that we graphed in here, so for instance, right there, notice that this parabola opens up upwards, right? And as it opens upwards, it doesn't have the range for all values. So if I go back into the one that I copied, so really your range, so all the y values that we have, live in this particular world, right? They go up, but we do not have any values below our vertex. So your range is always going to be restricted. And it is restricted, okay, basically by where your vertex is. So to be able to find out what the range is on any quadratic, what you really need to know is, you need to know, okay, so what is the vertex? Okay, so what's the value of y for the vertex? Because that's going to be either your maximum or your minimum value that you have. All right. So within here, in this case, this is your minimum value for, okay, so that's the minimum value for your y. 
If it was looking downwards, it would have been your maximum value for your y. So here we are restricted in some way that y is basically okay, restricted by this value of the vertex. Now, what was that value? Now, we know it because we've already have it right here okay? because we know what the vertex is. So we know that, so this is negative 25 over 8, and we know that y is going to be greater or equal to that value. And if we're setting a range, so y can be any real number, but such that, so here's our set, so this is our range, okay, y is equal or greater to negative 25 over 8, because there's nothing below it. Now, if the parabola is looking downwards, then what you have is you're going to, okay, have the actual range being restricted, so it's going to have a maximum, Okay, and then all the values below it of y are there. So in general, what you have okay, for your range, you're going to have two things. So here is your range. So what do you need to think about? Okay, you need to think about vertex value of y. What is it? That vertex value of y is going to have a minimum value of y or a maximum value of y. Now, what does that depend on? The minimum value of y is if the parabola is looking upwards. So it looks like this. The maximum value of y is going to be if the parabola kind of looks like this. So here is your maximum point, and here is your minimum point. All right? So that minimum point, so let's call that the, the min, okay? And this would be your max. So what you would have is y would have to be always greater or equal to your minimum value of your vertex that you have. And then in here, your y is actually going to have to be less than because this is your maximum value. So if you're creating your range and you want to properly state it, you would say that, okay, well, y is equal to all real numbers, but it is being restricted Okay, by the minimum of the parabola. And then within here, what you would have right there, let me duplicate it and put it below. If that's the case, then it looks exactly the same. However, now it is being restricted by the maximum value right there. Now, how do you know if it's a minimum or a maximum? Well, in quadratics, it's actually not very difficult to tell because Remember that in your vertex form or in your standard form, what we have is we basically have something like this. This is your vertex form, right? So we know what the value of y is, and this value of a tells us if the parabola is opening up or it's opening down, depending if it's positive or negative. And that will tell you if you have a minimum on the range or the maximum on the range, which should help you quite a bit, all right, if you ever have to state them. So in recap, the domain is not restricted because it's just a regular polynomial. There's nothing to worry about. Now, in the range, you are restricted by the minimum or the maximum value for your y, all right? And that's pretty much it for this review, okay? So it's probably a little bit lengthier than maybe you wanted. I hope that it gives you a good sense um, and gets you started, okay? And again, you refreshed yourself on these quadratic functions. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in a future video. Bye, everybody.